through all that, you know, what are the things that test us? And, you know, a lot of people think, well, cancer is a medical challenge. Medical challenge, end of story. But it isn't. And you'll see through these. And these aren't all of the ways that cancer has tested me, but these are just some examples. Um, use that D word, because fear of dying really numbed me, particularly early on, and distressed me. And uh, that, as we know, creates um, psychological, emotional mayhem, etc., etc. Creates all sorts of problems. My lifestyle and life patterns were totally disrupted, just as yours will have been when you were diagnosed. Um, everything's thrown up in the air, nothing's certain anymore, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. All our um, order, a world order is thrown up into the air. I found an imperfect medical system, and I say that with total respect to the medical practitioners who are here speaking today, because I'm not talking about them, I'm talking about the systems that um, I think Jackie, I think Jackie Blue mentioned this morning that you might see 28 doctors. Um, during the course of your treatments, etc. Well, you know, then look at all the nurses and look at all the, you know, various other people. Uh, it, it's very difficult for them to coordinate in a way which gives you seamless, uh, coherent, cohesive treatment all the time. And again, I'll just go back to that point. We have to be proactive in uh, being patients uh, and watch what's happening, question, quiz uh, in a respectful way and become partners with our medical people, I believe. The cancer uh, and the treatments and procedures knocked me around pretty hard at times. It's a no-brainer. I was anxious uh, prior to many of the endless consultations, procedures, you know, what are the results going to be? I've had a bone marrow biopsy. Um, is that clear? Is that not clear? If it's not clear, the consequences I know are not good, etc., etc., etc. I found real trouble expressing how I felt to anyone. And that was a real issue from day one. When I was a teenager, I couldn't express anything. You know, in terms that had an emotional connection or an emotional element to it. Um, and I didn't improve much for a long, 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 long time. And my wife would probably say that I haven't improved at all that much even today. However, I think I have um, relative to that. But, you know, I was mute in the face of this biggest challenge of my life. I found that extraordinarily hard. I felt lonely and isolated, even in good company, I say. Um, and, but I actively shunned others. I don't know, I can't remember when I spoke to another person with my disease, honestly, uh, consciously, um, it was years and years and years and years down the track. I really didn't want to associate with other people who had what I supposedly had. Maybe it was denial, maybe it was this, that, whatever. I certainly uh, wasn't interested in going to any cancer support group, I can tell you that. Failed treatments, and I did have a lot of knockbacks um, during all that time. Poor results and prognosis deflated my optimism and diminished my hope. And that is... That can be terrible and that can be tragic in fact, because without hope, you know, what is the opposite of hope? It's despair and despair is a downward spiral sometimes. So those things were extraordinarily serious. Physical changes made me self-conscious and lowered my self-esteem. And by the way, there's a, this is a cautionary note. If you're ever having your spleen out, and I hope you don't, and the doctor comes and says, would you like a vertical cut or a horizontal cut? <laughs> Tell him what you want, but be loud and clear because I woke up from my operation and I had both, and I looked like a sausage that had been cut into bits and then sort of sewn up with the, you know, that big sort of hideous twine that they use. I sort of took the bandage off, I was like, oh, what the hell? <laughs> I thought I was gonna have a great dueling scar, but no, it was quite disappointing. Some relatives, friends, and workmates avoided me, some patronized me, didn't mean to, but they did. Few understood me, and I felt alienated and different from other people, and that's a really hard place to be. And I think, I'm guessing that many of you have felt that or are feeling that through your current circumstances or your past circumstances, it's difficult for other people who can't understand what is happening to you or are very, very uncomfortable with the fact that you're facing your mortality. Witnessing others' journey in the ward created vicarious heartache and fear. It's extraordinarily hard to, you know, while you're going okay, and then you hear, you know, through the veiled private plastic screen that they put around your neighbour, um, that they are doing it very tough, and in fact things are not working and all that sort of thing. That's extraordinarily hard. At times the medical people seem not to be hearing me or acknowledging my needs, making me feel pow powerless and frustrated. That is not a dig at the medical people. That is a, uh, a wake-up call for me that I needed to learn to be able to engage with these people in a way that actually got us the sort of results that we wanted. 
And I was sometimes troubled by existential thoughts, you know, what has my life been? I didn't expect to die, but occasionally you would have sort of images go through your mind, it's natural. Uh, what has my legacy been? You know, my achievements through life really must have been pretty meagre. I'm not really happy about this, and I've seen many other, um, you know, people affected by cancer in the wards going through similar discussions or opening up discussions on this sort of topic. And through it all, I never held a remission. And I always expected to get cure. I mean, that was always my goal. No matter what, I would say to the doctors, it doesn't matter, this didn't work, that's okay, what's next, let's think about it. It was always cure. And I guess after the last recurrence, I had to um, resign myself to the fact that I may not actually get to cure. But I sure as heck am going to keep on getting recurrences, uh, sorry, get uh, remissions and continue on and on and on and on and on. I hope. So as my experiences have shown me, and as you can see there, cancer and its treatments can bring all kinds of physical, psychological, emotional, social, and economic and spiritual stresses. That's a real mouthful there. But the point I'm making is that it is certainly not just a medical challenge. It is all that stuff. If it was just a medical challenge, then the only people you would need to talk to and rely on would be your medical staff. It's not, and so you need to talk to other people, such as our friends down here. From the moment of our diagnosis, those stressors can, have, can affect our ability to focus and function well, and at times they can even potentially reduce our will to live. They can do that. I mean, how many men here who have been through man flu have said to themselves, you know, I want to die? Well, magnify that. <laughs> magnify that many times on occasions in terms of what you're going through, and you can see that at times maybe, you know, in the back of your mind, the glimmer could say, really, do I want to continue with this? Now, I realise that the ladies will not understand man flu. Um, but it is, it is real, it is potent, and it is dangerous. So what I've found is that resilience, uh, in terms of the, the things that I do to raise my resilience or pull my resilience back, which we'll go through, has been the main catalyst for helping me cope with what I need to, be open to the support that I have needed, something I certainly wasn't for a long, long time, and sustain my passion for life and optimism for my future. Because those things, I think, collectively are extraordinarily powerful in terms of enabling us to cope with what we need to cope with to get to the other side. So in the face of these kinds of ordeals, the overarching needs for resilience for me, and hopefully some will resonate with you, Whatever could help me create and build my hope and optimism. So what was that going to be? And, you know, I went on uh, a journey of, uh, of review, reading, questioning, etc., for many, many years uh, to try and find out what those things were. What could help sustain me physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all that long sentence again, through both the acute and chronic times of cancer and its treatments? Because the acute and the chronic times of cancer are different experiences. They may have some commonalities, for sure, but they are different experiences. And you, you know, you, you, you people, um, through your conversations throughout this conference, I imagine would have come across those. You know, I suffer from that. I, I, I find that really difficult. Really, that's not an issue for me. But I, you know, have this other thing. So we're all individuals, and we will all have individual challenges. We won't have the same. You won't have exactly the same as me. Nobody will. But you'll have some of them. And what we need to do is to be able to cope, to be able to hang on, and to be able to be resilient enough to be able to continue through. And whatever could really help me really want to keep going, no matter what, no matter what I was suffering, no matter what I was experiencing, no matter what the doctors told me, I want to keep going, and I'm determined that I'm going to get there, you know, to the point of coming across to the doctors at times as completely arrogant and actually in my own little world, I think. But it worked for me. So I want to give you some examples of my resilience practices what enabled me to hang on in those sort of circumstances? And again, those of you who have read my book, none of this will be a surprise. Well, a couple of them actually might be, but most of them won't be. So the foundation factors. I look for avenues to continual moderate physical activity in and out of the hospital. What I found was when I was in the hospital for lengthy periods of time, I was in there for about six months at one stage with only a couple of escapes, and um, I didn't recognise it, I didn't realise it, but I started wasting away. And, you know, I went and looked at myself in the mirror at one stage to have a shower, and I was very weak and all that, and I got there, and I had chicken legs. Chicken legs. These. And I had never had chicken legs before, and this was a real wake-up call for me. It was like, oh, my goodness, what's happened here? So I found that um, by doing little things uh, while in the ward, walking around the ward, 
um, you know, sitting up and sitting down and doing all those little sort of things when in the hospital. I went outside um, the hospital, again, sitting there and instead of, I don't know, maybe instead of, I think I mentioned that one in my book, instead of um, using the remote to change the TV channel, get up and actually walk to the TV. And actually that, those sort of activities um, collectively actually made a big difference for me. Big difference. I had more strength. I had a bit more stamina. Um, I was able to regain some more weight in conjunction with eating a lot more and those sort of things. I avoided alcohol while in treatment or post-treatment recovery, and I do like a Pinot Noir, as you guys last night will have seen. Um, I ate well to support my needs at the time. Now, eating well is a different um, coined phrase than you often hear, which is, you know, eat... Uh, well, it'll be a different phrase, because they're talking about um, scientifically um, eating um, to, you know, to give yourself the most sustenance in your body and things like that. Now, for me, I went through a whole bunch of different experiences within a short period of time. I lost 10 kilograms in a week, and we didn't know why. I was eating, you know, and uh, I might not have been, you know, voracious in my appetite, but I was certainly eating reasonably well, and the hospital had no idea that this had happened. And Jill, my wife, picked it up and said, do you realise? And I said, no, I couldn't have. But yeah, I had. So, for instance, at that time, um, you know, we had to do, use a different strategy than eating food, which was, you know, you know, X number of veggies, X number of, you know, carbos and things like that. I just became a pig. And, no, I, I did. And what I found was, I mean, I ate just about anything, you know. I mean, Jill had to watch where her arms and legs were at times because... <laughs> But I did that. Now, I know that, I mean, this is, you know, this is pop science at the very best and all that in terms of the problems, you know, re the reason why some people can lose a lot of weight. But obviously, in my case, I, I didn't have an acute uh, problem in, in that regard. I was, I was simply wasting away because maybe I wasn't eating so much and because of the effect of the cancer, etc. So actually eating a lot more at that period of time enabled me to put on that 10 kilograms within about another two weeks. And if I extrapolate that, what that did was, there's a whole chain of reactions in this sort of thing, and what, it, what that did was it gave me more energy, more strength, and that enabled me to put on some more weight by the following week. And then I had an appointment with the hospital to see whether I was going to have a stem cell transplant and, and high-dose chemotherapy. And when I went back, I was in a state whereby I could. I had the energy, I had the weight, I had the will, you know, they look in your eye, you know, are you sure you're... You know, yes, yes, yes. I had all that regain simply through... Um, eating, you know, just about anything that was on the menu, anything, everything. And I ensured I got ad adequate sleep and rest and, you know, uh, in terms of we're talking about a situation, you know, cancer where stress and distress um, are major issues, uh, nothing will stress us more than not having enough sleep. I mean, those people with young children, you know, and you, some of you will think back and some of you will think to your current situation. Um, some of you will think forward and decide not to have them uh, or whatever. But uh, people who've had young children are sleep deprived will know that it's extraordinarily exhausting. Extraordinarily exhausting and hard to take. And therefore, if you're in that state, how can you actually consider your own interests and needs in terms of a cancer battle? So here... Uh, relaxation and cognitive restructuring approaches. I meditated and I visualised. Now everyone will do different things. And I just want to caveat that not everyone who looks at this will need to do what I did or all of the things that I did. You might just pick up one or two things that resonate with you and they may be extraordinarily effective. But meditating and visualising enabled me to uh, get a sense of peace and also to focus. Um, it de-stressed me. Um, I focused on my desired outcomes because I could, because I wasn't, um, you know, my mind wasn't disjointed and my thoughts weren't scattered. Uh, I made better decisions, you know, when the doctors come to you and say, well, here's 10 choices, which one do you want? I feel that I actually looked and researched and, and gave them better answers. I communicated better, what I was talking about before, in terms of feeling like the doctors weren't communicating with me in a way, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I had to make the change. They couldn't make the change. I'm just one of hundreds of patients that they see. And so I started to be able to engage with them in ways that gave me better